question. Uh, my name is Stefan Larsson. I'm a social legal scholar at Lund University, that's southern Sweden. I woke up with this voice today. And uh, Rod Stewart, uh, thank you. I woke up as Rod Stewart this morning, and I felt old. But uh, so I won't be talking much. Um, I'll be the sort of timekeeper uh, mostly. I just want to mention briefly that uh, yeah, Lund University is the host, uh, and it's because um, Katja primarily um, uh, hosted a sort of a workshop in August on on GANs. We wanted to figure out what this particular AI technology meant for. Uh, from multiple, re I mean, from many different fields, like legal issues, uh, how does industry use it, uh, any other sort of uh, conundrums that comes up. And so Katja has really been the sort of the framing this session today. Um, what I do really like about it is the diversity of the session. Uh, it's not, of course, given this conference, it's not just tech. It's, um, we have uh, Katja as a sort of philosophical and slash legal data protection perspective. Uh, you will talk more of the conceptual issues as well. Um, and we have Abby on my right here, a physicist. So that sort of changes, uh, we talk about astrophysics, we talk about uh, bio biology in a sense, so that's a really a different perspective. We move on, Sari to my left is a lawyer, copyright law, IP law, which is um, really interesting questions within, in, in, in relation to, to sort of generating uh, AI. And then uh, Mario Klingemann, uh, an artist using the technology for artistic reasons. Uh, but first out, Katja. Um, yeah, and sort of the order here. We have seven to 10 minutes presentations and then f ending up um, with about, yeah, something like 20, 25 minutes of panel talk. Uh, uh, and, and it will probably be open for some questions from the audience at that stage. But firstly, Rod Stewart hands over to Katja. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's nice to see many people here because the, the topic of this panel maybe is not kind of a directly classical data protection CPDP topic. But I, I will begin with this. I think it's very important. To, to frame this topic. I, I have talked about creative artificial intelligence a few times before, and I've used this slide a few times before. And normally I ask, does anybody recognize these people? I can ask that question here again. Well, I thought in this, in this uh, setting, maybe the better question is, are, is this personal data? No, well, probably not, but we will come back to that because these, these are synthetic people. These pictures are of people that do not really exist, but that look convincing. They are so-called deep fakes. And in my uh, existential moments before I go to bed, I sometimes go to the, the website, this person does not exist. And every time you refresh the page there, you get a new non-existing person. There's an artificial intelligence system called, again, a generative adversarial, adversarial network that generates a new non-existing face. And it's, it's nice, so I refresh. I think, oh, that's a convincing face. I try to see, are there giveaways that it's a fake? Is there some asymmetry in the eyes maybe, the ears? I refresh. It's very meditative before going to bed. Refresh again. And it's also interesting, the, it gets better. So you see technology is getting better. The, the eyes get more rea realistic over time. And so this is a screenshot of how the, how the actual page looks. And you, you see that in the beginning, it was just this page, but now there are links to other sites, so you can also go to the website. This article does not exist, also very meditative. There, the, the, web, the website grabs all the headlines from web pages like Reddit, and then 
the creative algorithm behind it generates a text based on that headline. And every 30 minutes, they grab new headlines and you can see new articles written by AI. You, you, there's also a link to the, the page about scenes from Friends and the Office. Every 10 seconds, a new scene written by an AI from Friends or the Office. But I also like this site. This cat does not exist, because I think it tells us something about the technology. Faces are very centered. It's very standardized. Cats do not sit still for pictures. They run around in the picture. And you see some pictures of this of non-existing cats are quite good. But they are also more, <laughs> no. this is not a very good fake. I, I could pick this one out as being non-existent. So then I, I do this before I, right before I go to bed, and then I feel comfortable about the world, especially this one. Uh, so when we talk about fake, fake AI-generated data, one of the main legal ethical perspectives on this that we read about in newspapers is, is the possibility for fake news. There's a lot of research being done right now on the question, what does it mean that we live in a society where seeing does not equal believing? If we see a video of Trump saying things, how do we know that he actually said it? Or here we have in China, they don't need news anchors anymore. You just have a virtual puppet who says whatever you want. So there's democratic concern about this. But in this panel, we actually wanted to not so much focus on the, the, the democratic dimension of this, but look at, at different aspects. And that is that we're not just at the, the dawn of an era of an avalanche of fake, fake news, uh, fake cyber porn, fake footage, but we are, I think, at the dawn of an era of an avalanche of synthetic data in general. And given that we, CPDP focuses on, on data a lot, I think this is a very relevant question for us. What does it mean to live in a world that's a flood with synthetic data? And some of the synthetic data will be personal data. But I think that is a too limited perspective to focus on. I think it's very good that we talk about synthetic data in a more general sense. If we only look at personal data, we might, we might end up like the, the blind man and the elephant, that we say, it's, it's personal data, it's personal data. But I think it's important to look at what does it mean to have synthetic data in society more in general. So I will first talk a bit like a philosopher, because I think we, we need metaphors and then, at the end, I will come to the GDPR, because I think there are many GDPR lawyers here, and I need to, to satisfy <laughs> that nobody goes to, to CPDP perfect. and claims money back. So first, some philosophical musings, and then GDPR. So here, I, I have the, the only quote in this presentation is Stefan Larsson, who has written an excellent book in 2017, where he says, without concepts and imagery, we cannot speak about or understand the new. And without metaphors, we have no concepts for new phenomena. And I think this is what we first need to think about. How, how are we supposed to think about synthetic data, data generated by AI? So if we go back to the, to the website, this person does not exist, or this article does not exist, in the, in the corner, you can, you can help the project. And it says, help this AI to continue to dream. Is this what we should say that creative AI is doing? Is it dreaming up new people? One of, I mean, there are many techniques. There are many techniques that are generative AI or creative AI. One of the most successful techniques was, was launched in 2014 by this, this guy, Ian Goodfellow. He's the, the GAN father. And here the headline is, this is the man who has given machines the gift of imagination. To which extent is such a metaphor useful? So just to give you some words that are used 
in the context of synthetic data. Imagination, creativity, can you say that the machine creates stuff? You can say that it augments stuff. You can use this technology, for instance, to, to change your data. If you have a picture with rain on it, you can change, you can derain it. You can change the age of a person. You can extend a video. You can continue a poem. Is this generation, is it simulation of data? Is it machines dreaming, hallucinating, as some people say? Should we call these data synthetic? Should we then make the distinction that we have natural data that are contrasted with synthetic data? Is it deception, fakes? Is it mimicry? Are these variations on reality? Do we have original works here? So what we can say often what you see is, if you think about these faces, that there is a variation on reality, you could say. These faces look like people that we could encounter on the street, but they are just a bit different. And one of the powerful things that you can do with synthetic data is something that is, I would say, close akin to how imagination can work in human beings. So I, I have two kids who have to learn things all the time. One kid that's two year old, one that is five, and especially the two year old, I have to say, look, that's a dog, that's a, a car. And in, in contrast to an AI system, my kid does not have to see 100,000 examples of dogs to distinguish dogs well from cats. Why, why could that be? I think one reason is because the kid has imagination. I show my kids 20 examples of dogs and the kid can imagine more examples of dogs. And you can see that synthetic data can have the same powerful effect if you look in the field of classification learning. So for instance, when we go to the internet, you don't have to understand this, I mean, this is just an article. When you go on the, uh, on the internet, you often have this Turing test. If you want to enter a website, you have to enter a CAPTCHA. It's this kind of difficult text, degraded text that needs to distinguish, are you a computer or are you a human being? If you can read a text, then you're probably a human being. This has been a difficult task for computers. But now in this article, they used a set of real CAPTCHAs, and then they created many, many, many other synthetic CAPTCHAs. And then they train the computer on reading the text based on this augmented larger set, a combined of synthetic data, synthetic CAPTCHAs, and real CAPTCHAs. And what you see, the machine learns much faster. It suddenly is much better, it becomes much better in resolving these CAPTCHAs. So this is a powerful tool. In that sense, I mean, uh, we don't have kind of really imaginative machines, but in that sense, you can say there is something of imagination happening. And I think there is another reason why the metaphor of imagination might be useful, namely that imagination can lead astray. I, I, I have this, uh, this drawing in my house, it's uh, Don Quixote, and he, he is lost in fantasies. He has read too many books, and he thinks he is in the Middle Ages, and he is surrounded by dragons and God knows what. He is lost in fantasy. And here we, we have something to think about. Once we have synthetic data, simulated data, fake data, whatever you want to call them, they are a powerful tool, but they can also very much lead astray. How do you know that the synthetic data really represent reality in the way you want to? So now GDPR. Do I still have three minutes or something? Yeah. Yeah. GDPR. So why, why is this interesting? synthetic data to GDPR lawyers. One, one of the reasons is that there is the idea that you can use synthetic data to anonymize data. So you have, you have data, I don't know, uh, brain scans, whatever, and you want to anonymize them. Then you make synthetic variations on them. Then you preserve much, much of the, the informational value of this, those data. But hopefully, you can use this as anonymization. So th this is a bit of the holy grail of anonymization. The questions are, is this really anonymization in the sense of the GDPR? Because there is a risk 
that if you kind of make variations on reality, sometimes you will end up very close to reality. If one of those pictures that were generated by this person are not exist, looks exactly like me. Is that personal data? So the question of, can we, there are two questions. You know, what if there's an accidental doppelganger? And the question, can we actually go back from synthetic data to the orig original source in some way? And then there is also the question, can you use can you use, uh, can you use synthetic data as a way to provide profile transparency, for instance? Uh, we, we all don't want situations where decisions are taken and the decision-making process is black box. So there has been much research focusing on how can you give transparency about classificatory algorithms about algorithm, uh, algorithmic decision making systems and one of the one of the proposed ways proposed by Sandra Wachter is that you would give counterfactual examples this is also basically simulated data so we can imagine you are an eBay seller you get banned uh, because some algorithm says that you're a potential fraudulent uh, seller and you want to know why then one way to go is that you create lots of simulated data. In a way, you fill up the missing gaps. Yeah, so we, I, uh, people in the field talk about latent space. I can imagine that I see empty spaces here, and I let the, the spaces be filled up with synthetic people. All the, all the empty spaces are filled up. And if you do that, if you create lots of synthetic eBay sellers, you can say, well, this is the closest synthetic fake eBay seller that, should not ha that would not have been banned. And that, that could give insight. That you think, okay, this is the difference between me and the imaginary eBay seller, so I have to change this not to be classified as Roland. But here we come again back to my Don Quixote. To which extent is this reliable? Can we really trust this? Uh, and finally, now I have like two seconds. Uh, no. What about the personal information? What if Facebook is going to filled, be filled with uh, images of fake images of me, you know, involved in criminal acts and fake porn? How do we treat that? Is there a remedy from the GDPR perspective? Can we say that Facebook is um, responsible for keeping all the data reliable and accurate and up to date, and that that means banning synthetic data, synthetic personal data? Well, I leave you with those thoughts. Thanks. Thank you, Katja. And uh, we invite uh, Mario Klingemann up, uh, who's going to shift computers. And I think, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of questions. We're not going to de debate them right now, but I think we're going to stick to the theme of creativity, particularly since uh, Mario is an AI artist from Germany. Um, things like... Um, human creation versus machine creation. Things like um, how new should something be to be addressed as new? The n sort of the newness, the newness aspect of something new. And um, uh, the ability of GANs to create things that they have never been trained on. Um, things like that. You need to uh, speak in the microphone. I think you're ready. You're set. Right? I'm ready. Yes. I, the, the contents might have slightly changed towards what I said before, but yes. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the, the practicalities of uh, being an artist and working with these new technologies, and particularly AI, and uh, want to kind of go actually a little bit into the, what's actually happening when we, when we train these models. So yes, I'm an artist, and I use AI. To, to make art. And uh, in some sense, I, I work a lot with images. And I would say, I find them rather than I create them. Because in s that process is in somewhat indirect. Because what I do is I train these neural networks. And then they are able to make a lot of images. And uh, well, I pick a few of them or combine the models. And uh, well, the output I call art. But it's never that I take an existing image, image into Photoshop and make pixel adjustments. It's more I point, I build this weapon, I point it into a direction, and then it's, uh, it's making the work for me. 
And well, so I would say the universe in which I am operating is the digital image or the bitmap. And I really want to call it a universe because, uh, well, this is a bitmap. Actually, this is ground zero. It's not an error, it's, it's the black image, uh, a black bitmap. So it's a huge spreadsheet filled with zeros because that's what a bitmap is, a huge, gigantic spreadsheet. But you can also see it if you take every number in that image and make, put them in one line, what you get is a vector. And that vector points to a certain location in a high dimensional space. And the funny thing is that pretty much every image that you could imagine, you could never imagine that exists, is possible to, to be displayed with this vector. So the problem is this space, space is immensely huge. It's actually bigger than the universe. So the, the combination of numbers that you can create in a bitmap like this is higher than the number of atoms in the universe. And the problem is then, if you just take a random vector, a random position in that space, it will very, very likely uh, look like this. It's just random noise to us. And that's the problem. And creativity is the point of finding the little habitable planets within this gigantic space that when we look at them say, oh yes, there's something I recognize. Uh, and so my job is to find out what makes an image interesting that we look at it and recognize it as art or something that makes you happy, sad, uh, enraged. And uh, well, but the funny thing is that, yes, all these images live in the same space. And uh, it's sometimes, well, just a few pixels away. And it's a totally, for us, a totally different image. For the machine, it's just a little offset within that space. So, well, until about five, six years ago, the only way to get into that space was uh, because to be, get digital was to use a camera or a scanner or maybe the Microsoft Paint or Photoshop to set every pixel yourself. So, but in the end, it's still, let's say you take a picture with a camera, which creates this unique vector in that space. And you rotate the camera a little bit, and that image looks very similar to the one you took before. And that means also that vector in that space, that position, is somewhat in the neighborhood. Now, since, uh, since about five, six years, we have new ways of getting the pixels on this bitmap into a, in a, the right order, you could say. And that is the Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs. And uh, we already saw these pictures, yes. And these GANs have become so powerful now that they are able to move these little pixels just in the right way that we believe that there is a face on it. And, uh, well, the other thing is they become, the, the model becomes very controllable because what you can see in this example for is, is that, well, the base face underneath where they are looking at or some is always the same. So if it's a female one, then you, well, it's just another dimension on which you can move to, to change the skin color or the hair color or the gender. So for the model, kind of this space becomes, well, the, the dimensions that for us are kind of ungraspable become kind of, yeah, you can put a direction on it and you can move along a direction in that space and make a person smile on that photo or change their age. So all these factors become very controllable, but in the end, well, it's just about for the model just to know, well, what pixels to change. So there are a few terms when that I quickly explain what is actually happening under the hood. So one thing is there are model architectures. This is kind of the way these neural networks are put together. It's really like a house, you could say. And well, there are typically two very, well, large, like classical one. And both of them are like a pyramid. One is like pyramid up. So you put very little data in to the top, a few numbers. And then over the time from layer to layer, this information gets enriched by the neurons inside there so that in the end, the output is an image, for example, which has a lot of data. So that's a typical a generator model. The other way works too. So you put in a lot of data, a lot of numbers, an image, and over the, the layers, the, that information gets more and more reduced and so that in the end, 
you get maybe a hundred different numbers which tell you how likely it is that on this image is a cat or a dog or a house or if this is a fake image or not. Within these layers live the neurons and uh, well they are a little bit modeled after they are in our brain. That means a neuron gets several inputs from a, a layer above, which is again single numbers, and then it multiplies every of these numbers with a certain factor, and then it adds them together and passes on the result to the next layer, which is then typically a little bit of another one, but that does a threshold. But that's pretty much all that's going on, only that a million of them are at work. And the third term is the weights, and that is pretty much the stuff we train. The weight is that multiplication factor that gets attached to every of these inputs, which controls the output. So the weights is, well, almost like what makes the intellectual property in that model. Because an architecture is like an empty house or like an empty room, and by training it, you kind of deselect the wallpaper and the furniture, and so the same room, the same model can either be like a, a study or a sleeping room or a kitchen, uh, just depending on what you put into it by training it in our case. Now, GANs are a very special breed of these models because they are actually consist of two neural networks. One of them is a generator, which is the kind of put a little bit of information in at the input and you get an image out at the output. The discriminator is the opposite one, where you say you give it an image and in the end you get a judgment. And that judgment is if it's a fake or a real one. Now the fascinating thing is initially when you start from scratch, the model is kind of random. It, they don't know anything about the data. Now, I asked, well, this GAN, okay, create me uh, a model that makes faces. So what I do is I give it millions of examples of existing faces, and as we heard before, they are typically always aligned because that makes it easier for these models to train because they are not so good. But so now, the discriminator, like, no, actually the generator creates an image. And initially, because it hasn't learned anything, it's just random gibberish. That image gets put into a box, and it creates thousands of more. Now, in that box, also, some of the real images are put, you could say, so like real faces. Now, the discriminator picks one image randomly out of the box, looks at it, and has to decide, is this a real face or is it a fake face? And initially, it has no idea how to distinguish them, so it just, well, randomly decides. And then, well, it turns around the picture, you could say, and on the backside it says, oh, this was a real one or this was a fake one. Now, if the generator, the discriminator was right, it will kind of, well, and that was a fake image, it will kind of tell the generator, oh, I caught you, you made a mistake, do better next time. At the same time, if it, like, took a fake one and called it real or a real one and called it fake, it learns itself, it tries to learn how to distinguish these two things better. So the first important thing is to know is that, well, I don't know if it's important for, for intellectual property or something, that the generator never sees the training data. It just gets told by the discriminator model if it's done good or not good. So I find that quite fascinating. It's almost like a wall between them. So the discriminator looks at the data, but well, it tries to build its own value system there. The fascinating thing is that initially these models know nothing, and over time, both of them get better and better, so that eventually we get these images that where we as human discriminators are not good enough to distinguish them anymore. One important thing is also the so-called loss function. This is kind of the way how the discriminator finds out how good it is. How close is this image to like whatever it was created to a real one? So it's a kind of a comparison method. And that's pretty much quite a, where a lot of research is going on and where we also could see this whole development from five years ago when the pixels were really pixelated, now super realistic. That loss is almost where a lot of Art, artistic work goes in by the developers, by the researchers who find better and better methods. How do you compare how similar two images are? Because uh, the simple way is you just, like if you know Photoshop, you load two images, you take the difference, and then you say, I add up the differences. The problem is this will not work because 
well, you could have almost the same image just offset by five pixels and it's totally not, not the same. So these models have to get an understanding what's important out of these loss functions. What is actually important in an image? Textures, features, certain things that are actually visible. So this is a fascinating uh, function which also I think we hear in a later talk that there, there are some problems with these measurements that occur. Well, as I said, well, there's one thing after you have finished training the generator, the discriminator gets thrown away. So you can get rid of it. The one that looked at all the data will, will not be used anymore. You then have one separate and single model which has one input like where you send in a few numbers and in the end you get an image out. So that is what you see that creates these, uh, these person does not exist images for example. So the discriminator, well, I still have to find some use for it because it feels like sad this, uh, that they are like then not being useful anymore. So important, again, is not a database. So anything this generator has learned, it's not that it learns like, oh, I, I make a database of lots of eyes and lots of noses and lots of mouses and then if somebody asks me to build a new image from it, I just make a collage and assemble them somehow together so it looks so good. No. This GAN learns in this pyramidal structure how to create these images from scratch. You could almost say in the early layers it's like a very coarse image where a single pixel doesn't tell you about the color of the pixel but more of the, what function this element will have later in the final image. So it could be saying this was will where an eye will develop and this is where a mouse will come and the later layers that add up on top of this information will always add more detail and more detail. But there is nothing where anything about the original data is being stored in that model. And if you take an image and say, okay, show me what the weights were, you, it's like you will never find where the image is being done because it's everything, all these neurons work together. So you cannot pinpoint and say, this neuron is responsible for your copyright infringement. It's this in total concert of all these neurons working together. And the same neuron is, can be responsible for a lot of different eyes in a higher layer. <clears throat> so what you have then, and that's fascinating, once you have a trained generator is it has learned something like a concept of how your, the structure, how your training data is structured and has built this thing called a latent space. And it is again, like, again, uh, like not again, <laughs> like a universe in which you can move around. And it's in some sense like the huge bitmap universe where everything is possible, only in this case it has reduced this to a subset of images that will make sense. It will not really produce noise. So you go to a certain location in that space and it will produce an image. And you go a little bit, well, to the side and it will produce an image that is slightly similar to it. So let me show you an example. So this is kind of how a flight through a latent space of a model looks that I didn't train myself. That's the other thing. There are models out there I call public latent spaces that are so huge that, uh, well, only companies like Google or Facebook or kind of big players can train them because it costs like uh, a lot of money and computer time to to, to train them to a certain thing, but then they put them in the public domain, you could say, or they put them out for people to use. And these models are so complex that they are becoming almost like a camera because the probability that if I go to a certain location, to a certain position in that space, and somebody else gets to the exactly same position is almost nil, except if I share where I found it. So for me, this latent space is really like almost going to an unknown country where you look for images. And yes, you can do that actually. Oh, and so this is, for example, the funny thing or the, the interesting thing is that the model does not only learn what you trained it, but it learns how to create anything between what you created and outside of it. And it becomes really like a landscape. And you can then question the model and say, can you find this image in your space? And so in this case, for example, it's that dog and it tries to, to fly through this space and find that image or tries to get as close as possible to it. And why this is so kind of pumping is because it's doing gradient descent. You must really imagine it's going 
almost like in a, in a hilly landscape and sometimes you have to go over a, a little hump to get to the next valley and it tries to find the valley where that dog lives. And at some point it gets pretty, pretty close. For me, I'm, it's more about the journey. So sometimes I ask the model, find me that, but then on the way I find much more interesting things. But so the, the, what's fascinating is that theoretically with these models, you can find things that the model was never trained on. Totally different. With the face model, for example, I can find landscapes because, well, somewhere in that space there is something you can get really close, which makes it probably also quite difficult to say, like, to make claims like, oh, this is my image is in your model. You used it for training. Another little example, the Mona Lisa. So this is, for example, like a bad example of trying to find the Mona Lisa with a model that was not very good. but. Uh, you can see, so I tried, I gave my model the, the Mona Lisa and then asked it, try to get close to it. And the funny thing is, if you know that it was the Mona Lisa, then you can maybe recognize things in here. But again, the model, like in its measurement of how similar, how close it is, it doesn't just look at the pixels. It also looks at semantic similarities. It says like, okay, I see a person sitting there and it it's kind of has a painterly texture. So I think this is quite close, even if the pixels don't match. And this is also uh, confining, it's the same model, big GAN. And it's, in this case, I confined a certain dimension so it can only use uh, furniture. So it tried to get as close as possible to the Mona Lisa only using furniture. So, and this is again like uh, I used the Mona Lisa in uh, in style again in this case and uh, con like prevented the model from using certain dimensions which control the style. But it kind of got close to to well what it is, uh, and I'm pretty sure that person also does not exist. So. Ah, so I don't know. I tried now to say like so. Imagine so for me, this space is a very is like a continuous kind of a continuum, and well, it's never really easy to say what is actually similar. But now you come have like intellectual property, where we say, okay, but this area in this space, I built this fence around. You are not allowed to 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 go there. Or there might be other areas where I get in legal trouble because it might be offensive or it might be something. So the, the problem now, like with images, it might have been easier because, uh, well, you said, okay, this is clearly a copy of my, of, of, of my work, but now I might be on the same stylistic dimension as your original data, but I might be on a, semantically, I might be, I don't know, two kilometers away. But so this comparison, becomes more difficult now because I can always escape you or try to escape. Of course, and also in our times, the, another dimension is time, right, in this fence, like, like how long ago was this made? But so I see this whole thing now really as this weird multidimensional space where it's an, a work is not a single point. It's more like a, a cloud around a certain zone there where people might claim copyright on, on part of that cloud. And uh, yes, uh, who's the artist is usually the question because, oh, now all the machines are doing it. Well, the thing is, right now, I believe I am still the artist because that machine is still kind of controlled by me. It, it might find me things, but uh, I, I might choose them and I might not have kind of set every single pixel, but then a photographer who goes out in the world also doesn't plant that tree and doesn't build that house that looks so nice in that photo. So for me, at the moment, there's no question that the machine is not really creative. It's more kind of, it's a filter in that information space or in the possibility space of all images, which narrows the, well, the burden of choice down to me, but in the end, I still have to make the decision and put it out there and uh, say, this is mine. And then, of course, you have to sue me and not the machine. That's the other thing. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mario. Uh, it was a lot of conceptual. I mean, I was thinking about Katja's uh, concept conceptual argument that uh, we talked about fences, something spatial. We talked about something sort of um, an areas and um, aiming a weapon at something. So it's a lot of uh, kind of contemporary wrestling game with the concepts to figure out what these things are. But uh, now we're gonna move uh, a little bit towards um, 
scientific simulations and sort of how can we trust what it is that's being created. Once we can break into the system. Once yes. we can get into the computer. Yeah. Technical support, we need oh the password. Oh, that's for, the, right. for the laptop. Oh, shoot, is it? Anyone from technical support there? What's the, the password for the laptop? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows? <laughs> Nobody knows? <laughs> Are you That's calling in the back? Yes, okay. We uh I'm so sorry, I password hand dot yeah. If you saw your the USB, dot. just put it on, on your computer. Yeah, yeah, just put it on your phone like yeah. it works. <laughs> <clears throat> we'll figure this out. <laughs> Anyways. This one? A brief mention about, um, this is Abby, Abby Waldron. Um, no, we're going to talk right about connector. particle physics, which is uh, uh, sort of a, not a field that I'm at all. Well, we... I don't have the right connector. Yeah. Um, Let me get one. HDMI. HDMI. I I have, I, know, I, know, I, know. I have uh, I But have she doesn't have my talk. No, it's in here. Oh, it's on here. Great. The other guy. Is there a password? Yes. yes. Ah, good. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah, great. Thank you. So okay. Well, amazing. Yeah. Lovely. If you close this. Mm -hmm. close and we're this. back. Oh, <laughs> and here. Yeah. Eddie's hiding. Great. Woohoo. <laughs> I think it's already open that here. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, I'm sure that, right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Hello. Hi. I work with computers. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to talk about generative modeling and science. Uh, so, I'm going to talk a bit like overview, like different concepts, like what what use cases could there be, and then I'll go into a few like specific examples from different areas, some from my area and some from areas that I know nothing about, but I'm going to try my best to give a good explanation of. Um, so I think there are broadly two uses, um, and the first one is trying to uh, learn an underlying distribution for, from complex data. So maybe I want to understand something about the physical laws that govern our universe, or something about like the way in which people behave based on like some data that I've gathered from the world around me. And then the second use case, I'd say, is generating new examples that are physically realistic or viable or useful to us in some way. So I can basically boil that down into like two use cases. One is which understanding, and then the second which is discovery. Um, so I'm a particle physicist, and the nearly everything we do, in the, at least the experimental part of my field, involves like smashing stuff together at really high energies and seeing what comes out. I'm a neutrino physicist, so we smash uh, protons onto a solid target, and then we focus the charge decay products that come out. We then let them travel hundreds of kilometers underground, where we detect them with huge detectors, basically to see how they've changed while they're traveling. Um, and doing all of this, the, the goal is really to try and understand something about uh, the nature of our universe, the rules that govern all of these quantum particles. And we've got a pretty good model. It's called the standard model. And we want to try and test it with experiments, like understand different things about the parameters, uh, find out the ways in which it doesn't describe the behavior we're seeing, like in my area. And, and this is, um, yeah, we think it works really well, but uh, we need to test it. And the trouble with it is that we can't directly calculate, based on the fundamental principles, what we're going to see in our detectors. And there are lots of reasons for this. I mean, I mean, one is the fundamental aspect of quantum mechanics. Like, on an event-by-event -event basis, we don't know what's going to happen. There's a probabilistic element to that. Um, the second part is nuclei are really big and really complicated. So we don't really understand what's going on inside the nucleus. So as soon as we uh, try to uh, have an interaction with one of these fundamental particles that maybe we do have a law that governs with a nucleus, We've got nearly no idea what's going on. Um, and then we want to build huge detectors out of lots and lots of nuclei and lots of atoms. And 
lots of things happen there that we just don't understand. We build the thing and then we try and figure out what's going on, but we can't, we just can't know everything. So if we want to see if our underlying physical model is really good, we need to make a detailed simulation of what we're going to expect to see based on that model because we can't just calculate it on a piece of paper. So to do that, we have really massive Monte Carlo simulations, uh, which take a long time uh, to make, and we try and do as good a job as we can and then compare that to the data that we actually see. Okay, and the, the really interesting use uh, um, case uh, for GANs in this is that our simulators, like, they're massive, and if we need to find out we need to change something, it can take really a long time to, to regenerate everything, whereas if we train a GAN to make the same kind of simulated data as it was making in the first place, then maybe uh, we can do that much faster, and maybe we can even go further and learn something uh, more fundamental that we, we didn't previously have the ability to do. So we can train again to, to uh, generate our simulated data. And I'm going to just give a, an example, and this is kind of a, a new use across the field, and I'll give one example from uh, electromagnetic showers uh, at CERN at the LHC. So what happens when you have one of these proton-proton and proton collisions and you have all of these different particles coming out, sometimes uh, you get, you get uh, an electron or a photon that showers in your detectors. They have really high energy. So an electron comes in and then knocks out lots of other electrons, photons, pair production, lots of mess. You get a big blob of energy, basically, in your detector. So you have something that maybe looks like this. And if we start off, the top row is like our traditional simulations, so probabilistic Monte Carlo generator. Uh, and then the bottom layer is some examples of similar events, so like close together in that latent space we were talking about before, um, uh, made by a GAN that was trained based on the simulated data to try and simulate the simulated data. And you can see that these examples look pretty good. They look pretty close to each other. Maybe you can come up with uh, some differences, but I mean, you, they look like similar blobs to the ones we simulated in the first place. Well, this is all very great. Um, but we don't just want to know what an individual event looks like. We want to understand the fundamental laws that would give predictions for all of these events. And in order to do that, we can't just like make realistic examples of what one electromagnetic shower looks like or what one face looks like. We need to come up with uh, a law that, that governs how we would generate all of the possible showers, and that needs to have the correct distribution. And as you can see here, or maybe not, depending on how good that, no, you can see. OK. so. Do I have a laser pointer? Yeah, I do. So what you can see here, the solid lines are the ones that have been generating with the GAN, and then the uh, transparent uh, histograms are the original Monte Carlo data. So we, ideally, we want the solid lines to match exactly where the transparent uh, histograms are. And what you can see is, in some cases, they're pretty similar. Um, but then in other cases, for example, here, uh, and now we've got, like, I think, uh, some sparsity in a different parts of the texture, so like how dense the energy deposits are in a certain region. Um, you can see that there's quite a difference here, um, because although uh, the GAN learned to uh, generate individual events really well, it didn't correctly yet uh, model the underlying distribution. Uh, I think this is not uh, necessarily an impossible problem. It's just like a work in progress uh, for, the, for, uh, for this field of research. But in principle, it can be a bigger problem. So if you have uh, enough training data that models all of the space that you're expecting to see, then I think uh, to, to get the distributions to match should be a solvable problem. But what if you don't have enough data to cover all of your space? And, and this can easily be possible if you start getting to a very high dimensional space, especially just like a regular image, it's hugely high dimensional. And so, uh, if you do get into this case and then, then your GAN starts predicting something about something uh, outside of its, its training region, you can't really know if that's going to be true or not, and you don't know if it has the correct distribution. There's also a problem called mode collapse, and that's where even if you give a lot of different types of things to train on, so say you're building an image classifier and you want to have cars, houses, dogs, horses, you can end up getting in a situation like where because of the way that GANs train, so you have your generator and you have your discriminator, if say your generator starts off only making dogs and then your discriminator learns that, okay, uh, if it's a dog, it might be real or it might be fake, but all of the other classes, they're real. I mean, the, the fake ones are only coming in the dog class. And then like in the next stage of training, uh, the generator spots that uh, if it gen makes a, a house, then 
the, the discriminator always believes it um, because it, in the previous round it learned the other way. So you can end up like getting this like oscillating behavior. And then at the end of the training, you have a generator that's only making uh, images from a really small set of the training data, and that's just where you've ended up. So you're only going to end up with images of cats, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, and this is really interesting when it comes to um, copyright issues later. OK, so there are some other uh, uses that I can think of. So basically, anywhere where you've got heavy computational simulation can be really interesting. So fluid dynamicists are using this a lot. Uh, I'll talk a bit now about astrophysical imaging uh, and then a little bit later about uh, synthetic biology. So maybe you could like, start creating creatures with this. Or uh, in material science, you could like, think about discovering uh, new materials. So in astrophysics, we've got a, uh, there's a problem which the uh, images of distant galaxies can be degraded or distorted in some way. So there are lots of different reasons for this. You could have atmospheric noise, gravitational lensing, detection noise. And we want to know, of course, what the galaxy really looked like before it got distorted. So, so you can use a GAN to do this in principle. So you start off with an original image. Um, uh, and then this is going to be uh, fed to a discriminator uh, along with the output of your generated image. But as, as an input to the generator, instead of just having like a random vector of numbers, you have some sort of degraded image. So this would be, like say, what your uh, satellite actually saw. And you want to try and reconstruct uh, the original image using this, your generator. And you train the discriminator to uh, uh, tell the difference between the recovered images and the, the original ones. And then hopefully you can get something physically realistic out. Uh, so this is an example of something that happens. So you start off with the original image, you degrade it, and then you want to get the GAN to take that degraded image and give you something that's close to the original. And you can see that the resolution seems to be pretty, uh, uh, pretty similar. Um, but there's a warning here, um, and it's really important. So all of the missing information that that's missing from the lower quality image, it basically just has to be made up by the generator. So if you do it well, uh, hopefully, then your generator learns to do something physically realistic. Um, but the chance it's actually going to be the same image that you started with is like incredibly low. I don't say it's impossible, but it's just incredibly low. So uh, if you look at these examples more closely from the galaxies, you can see like it's not the same image as your original. It's just made up some stars. and. There's some sort of artifact at the edge here where it's made up a lot of stars in a line as well, but like these aren't real, they don't exist, but this looks completely convincing. Okay, and yeah, and you could do this with anything else. You think you've, you're reconstructing something in a good way, but you're not. Like the information you've lost, you've still lost it. Just because it's physically realistic doesn't mean it's true. Okay. Um, that said, with the warning, I mean, I still think it's incredibly useful uh, to, to generate uh, single examples. So if you have a distribution, and maybe the real world hasn't given you very many examples from that distribution, um, so maybe you want to discover new materials or something, and it's really hard just to like make all the possible materials. I mean, it's going to take you a lot of time, a lot of effort, uh, new discoveries in synthetic biology. It's going to be incredibly hard to like try out all of the possible parameter space of things you could make in real world. Um, but maybe it would be interesting to do that. So whenever your question is what, not what does exist, but rather what could exist, that's when I think this is really interesting. Um, so, and this is a recent paper uh, of, from synthetic biologists where they're trying to create uh, little uh, um, creatures from frog stem, stem cells um, that can move. So they've got a... Um, a uh, evolutionary algorithm here. So they like make lots of different combinations of cells and they have them living in some environment and then they have a, a metric of how well they're doing, which is basically how far they can travel in the simulated environment. And then they let them go still in simulation for many generations and the ones that are most successful get to make more that are, are like them and they get to uh, run their simulations as well. And at the end, they, they have some, some winners, the ones that, that do the best. And those ones, they actually make, and this is incredible to me, uh, uh, actually from uh, the real stem cells. And then they let them uh, go in a real environment and see, see how far they do. And this is amazing. And in an example of like science is hard, you also see this arrow back 
backwards going there with the G. And this is because, like, well, sometimes your simulation doesn't really match your real world, and it turns out they hadn't quite got the density of the fluid right. So these little creatures got made thinking that they could like fly, and it turned out they had to walk. Um, so they had to update the simulation when they saw the results of the real, uh, the real ones. But yeah, this is fascinating, and I think it's a, a really interesting area of research. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. We've had some uh, brief mentions of copyright law or something like that uh, during the presentations, but now we're entering uh, uh, actually, concretely, into uh, intellectual property and copyright law uh, with Sari de Peru. She's a lawyer and acting, practicing lawyer here in Belgium. And um, yeah, but I, I ch I've made changes still. Sorry. How do I find my stick? Is it this one? Can we have any technical help? Sorry, again. We're being low tech. Okay. Try the other side. There it is. Yay. So there you go. Going to go back to my comfort zone because I was way, way out. Uh, <laughs> copyright, so lawyer stuff, very structured lawyer thinking. But let's start with how lawyers, IP lawyers, depict an AI, um, an AI system. We have, well, we have software, we have training data, we put them together, we have a trained uh, model, we can, uh, input some new data and something comes out that might be a picture, it might be some uh, diagnosis, it might be some part of uh, input, output for uh, autonomous vehicles. Seen like this, seems okay, normal schedule, schedule representation, but then we can start making IP analysis and we'll see there's a huge stack of different IP rights possible. We have Copyright on software. We have copyright on uh, the training algorithm, possibly. We might have, in the training data, we might have copyright because there might be images, there might be text, there might be music. The content as such may not be protected, but there might be database rights. So even if uh, they're raw data, there might be some kind of exclusive rights. And in addition to all of this, there might be trade secrets if there's um, if, if, if it's a closed data set that is not uh, pub accessible to the public. Same thing, after the algorithm has been trained, there might be copyright on the software. So we're no longer using the data as such, the protected content as such, but the, the, the result of the training of the software on the training data might result in uh, copyright on the software. Again, if we try to apply this trained algorithm on new data, the new data, might, there might be uh, protected content under copyright, there might be database rights, there might be trade secret rights, and all the way in the output stage, there might be copyright, but that's a quest big question that Mario asked before as well, there might be copyright on the output there, and there might at some point be patents as well in the whole process. There might be patents. So there's a whole bunch of exclusive rights that we may have to take into account uh, when we're uh, analyzing AI applications. Now, 
to make another schedule. We have the input data, we have the software application, we have the output data. What we're going to be talking about right now in my short presentation is only the input data because many, many IP lawyers have already asked the question, is the output, is it uh, protected, yes or no? Is there patent protection, yes or no? Is there uh, copyright protection on the output, yes or no? Is there an author, yes or no? All these questions have been asked. They're interesting questions, especially from a theoretical point of view, from a philosophical point of view, but from a more practical point of view, maybe we should ask the question as well, from the input side, on the input data, is there an impediment from a copyright point of view that might um, slow down the development of AI, or perhaps for the good of the bad, there is no uh, judgment in, in my question. So, when we look at the input data, as I said, there might be copyright protected uh, content because it's training data that might consist of text, uh, there might be images, there might be music, there might be code. All of these things may or may not be protected under copyright if they meet the, uh, the originality threshold. There might be protected database, so the content of the database may be raw data, may be not protected under uh, copyright, but if there's sufficient investment in the collecting, in the uh, organizing, in the presentation of the content, then there might be uh, copyright, uh, there might be um, an exclusive right on the database itself. So, difficult uh, situation for AI. We don't know. Often, there's uh, a an, an, uh, processing that goes on without really making this analysis. Probably, well, the, the, the analysis might be just uh, an analysis of uh, probabilities. What are the probabilities that there's going to be copyright protected content, there, there's a copyright, uh, there's a uh, protected database. Now, all of this processing, even if it's in a closed um, process of well, discovering what the content is, analyzing the content, training the algorithm, even if this is not a public use, this processing might be qualified in terms of exclusive rights. So, acts that can be pro protected under copyright, under database rights. So, this processing that we talk about in very neutral technical terms might actually be reproductions in the sense of copyright, there might be extractions in the sense of um, the, the database protection, and that means there's exclusive rights. That means that these right holders have to consent to this use prior to actually doing it. Meaning that if I want to start making an AI uh, system, if I want to start using this AI system, I have to clear all these rights of all these different right holders in addition to the copyright holders, also the database uh, right holders. So this is going to be a complicated exercise. What is the issue here? Well, the problem here is that uh, all kinds of uses that in the analog world are absolutely free and are outside the realm of copyright, of exclusive rights, in a digital world, they become protected uses. So if in an analog world, I want to read a piece of, uh, a piece of text, I want to look at pictures, there is no copyright protection for this. So even if I don't have a copyright license, I'm allowed to read a book. I'm allowed to look at pictures because there is no copying involved. Similarly, if in, uh, uh, in, in an analog world, well, even in uh, the digital world, but as a, one of the fundamental copyright principles, is that ideas are not protected. So an expression is protected, a, sp uh, a form is protected, but not the underlying ideas, not the concepts, not the information, not fashions, styles, etc. So all of these things, means there are certain uses that are outside copyright and certain uses that are inside copyright use. Now, if we move to the digital world, when I want to read something, I'm making a copy. When I'm trying to discover, when I'm trying to learn, when I'm trying to um, find out about certain ideas, about certain information, I'm relying on copies. So all of these uses that in an analog world are outside the control of the copyright holder, in a digital world, they come within the control of the copyright holder. So that might be a problem. So how did the legislature address this point? Well, we have a very large reproduction right, this exclusive right, is extremely large because it covers all copies. Whenever there's a second copy of any type of information, there's a copy. So even ephemeral copies, even 
uh, copies that last for only a nanosecond will be copies from the point of view of copyright. In order to compensate this large uh, scope of application, the legislator has come up with certain exceptions in order to uh, reach some kind of balance. And so the legislator says, okay, there's a number of technical copies, there are copies, there are reproductions, but if these, copy, if these copies meet a number of conditions, there are technical copies, ephemeral copies, there's, uh, they're necessary for certain, uh, for certain lawful uses, they have no independent economic significance, then these copies are exempted and you do not need the, the, the consent of the, um, the, the copyright holder. In addition to that, in the directive uh, of uh, 2001, very large uh, exception for everything that's teaching or research within universities. So there as well, there's some leeway that is possible uh, in addition to this. Now, there was a bit of um, uncertainty as far as big data is concerned and, and new AI applications are concerned because all the research that was going on at universities was more or less covered, so there was not so much of a problem, but there's a lot more going on. So there's a lot of AI that's being developed outside of universities. So what are we going to do with this? Well, some of it could be caught under this exception for technical copies because they're ephemeral copies because supposedly there's a lawful use uh, to discover this information. So Arguably, there's, um, there's uh, certain applications that fall within the, the, uh, the, um, the, the scope of application of this, um, of this particular exception. But not everything is caught. So the legislator in the very famous uh, directive uh, copyright in the digital single market came up with a new exception. So what is the motivation? Legislator says we need to make sure that copyright is not an impediment for finding new knowledge, for innovating. We need to make sure that all of this is possible as well. So in one of the, the recitals, this, uh, this, this motivation was put forward. We need to, um, to, to be able to do text and data mining because um, they're prevalent, prevalent uh, in the digital economy. Uh, and we need to support innovation. So that's the, the the, 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 uh, the rationale behind this, uh, this exception. They've worked with two exceptions, one exception for research at research institutions and one more general uh, exception. Both apply for text and data mining. Now, how is this defined? Text and data mining is any automated analytical technique aimed at analyzing text and data in digital form in order to generate information which includes, but is not limited to, patterns, trends, and correlation. So there we have clearly a, a general uh, definition with uh, some kind of uh, this, well, description of what we know today as text and data mining. Now, first exception is a mandatory exception that uh, is applicable for purposes of scientific research. Now, it's a mandatory exception, meaning that all the member states have to implement this exception in their, uh, in their copyright legislations, meaning that we have some kind of harmonized field within Europe. All the, uh, the, the member states will have to provide this exception. So there's on exchanges or uh, cross-border research, there's not too much of uh, a discussion. Which acts are being exempted? Well, acts of reproduction, acts of extraction, meaning that everything that's related to copyright, uh, database rights, and the new publisher's rights, those acts are exempted. So there is no, um, no consent is required. These reproductions are made for the purpose of uh, carrying out text and data mining, and only by research organizations cultural heritage institutions with the purpose of scientific research. So we have a fairly large exception, but it's only for the purpose of scientific research. What do we do with spin-offs afterwards? Point to be seen. One condition, uh, lawful access. So if the research institution has a number of uh, subscriptions, there's lawful access, then you can do whatever you want. Um, if you do not, well, you cannot be going and hacking databases with protected material. Second uh, exception is a larger exception, also mandatory exception, but it is um, not limited to research institutions. Anyone can use this exception for the purpose of 
text and data mining, as long as well, the, the, the copies are made as long um, are kept as long as is necessary for the text and data mining. The only condition there is there has to be the, the, the works or the, the protected subject matter has to be lawfully accessible. And one uh, big restriction is there may not be an opt out. So, whereas for this exception for the research institutions, an opt out is not possible for these. Um, application so for example let's say google let's say facebook they do a lot of text and data mining if an author or a right holder does not want to be part of this process they can opt out so we're reversing the logic of exclusive rights where normally under exclusive rights you need an authorization prior to the reproduction here by default the text and data mining will be allowed unless the person opts out so we're inversing the logic of uh, exclusive rights now, there's a whole number of risks and opportunities. Opportunities, obviously, being some advances in the medical field, while well, AI systems being very uh, efficient in spotting breast cancer, for example. So that's a very efficient, efficient use. There's an interesting use, for example, as well, finishing certain uh, pieces of, of works uh, symphony of, uh, of Schubert in this case that can be completed by analyzing uh, similar types of patterns in, in music. Becomes a bit more tricky if uh, AI is starting to write themselves, if they can start <coughs> composing music, that might be a bit more tricky and it might be, um, well, raising some new questions. These things that the legislature has thought about these acts of reproduction for the purpose of reading, for the purpose of understanding, for discovering new ideas, new trends, etc. Is that really a functional equivalent um, with the AI that we're knowing right now, that is now very rapidly um, developing? Because these AI systems are not limiting themselves to reading and understanding, but they also start creating. And we've seen certain examples where a, a copy might be the outcome, but not necessarily so. They might be very good substitutes. There is no exact copy, but it might be something really just off in the style of the original. There might be deep fakes. That might be, that might be a problem uh, as well, as we've seen before. Another question that we can ask, is there going to be a question that is very often asked, with AI uh, entering these artistic uh, fields, are the, are the AI systems now, are they artists? Is it, there's, no game, there's never going to be a replacement of artists by AI. No, probably not. So probably artists will still be artists. The question being, is this AI going to be an author? That's a different question. There will be an impact on revenues, maybe. And for sure, there will be a, a, an impact on the distribution of revenues. Because if we eliminate an author, if we eliminate uh, a physical person from the process. We need the originality uh, condition under copyright, but there's still other exclusive rights. For example, all the neighboring rights. We have neighboring rights for producers, audiovisual producers, uh, audio producers. We have the new uh, neighboring right for the publisher. Those rights are more targeting investment. So there's a different criterion. So the author is eliminated, but the investor remains. And so we can ask the question, are our IP rights that are very individually articulated, are they still adequate to, uh, well, to, to provide a frame for this collective impact? Yes or no? I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Zari. Thank you. <clears throat> so it seems that has to sum up this panel because uh, the time is up, right? Maybe one question. Do we, uh, do we have a time? Yeah, we can have one question from the audience. Do we have, um, we have one question. I have two questions to, to the artist and the lawyer on the panel. Um, <laughs> if I understood you correctly, sorry, and I would agree with that, there should or there is no copyright protection in AI generated art, at least from today's perspective. Do, do you agree as an artist? Do you think it's fair to be reduced to the position of a producer and maybe being uh, the right owner of a future uh, producer rights in the art that you produce? Uh, well, 
I understood it that like the machine itself cannot be kind of a creator, but for me, as I see it, it's like a ca another camera. And so, okay, so maybe I have the wrong understanding, but so for me, if I point my model at a certain thing and I select, I do a selection of images, it is just like any other photo and I don't ask if it was created with an AI or not. So that's kind of so, if I don't then tell anybody, like I could say I took, I, I painted it, right? I, it will be hard to distinguish. So just because there is a complex machine involved, uh, as long as I press the button and, uh, and say I made this, I would think, so I don't know, would you say that this is, <laughs> not, I'm, I'm wrong here and uh, I, I have the, and everything I do can be freely taken? Well, actually it was one of the, the, the points that struck me when you started talking, you said, I find these images, which is very interesting because this is like class one of my copyright classes when I teach my students. People who just find stuff, even if you have an expert eye, that doesn't make you an author. Um, Interesting, you're yeah. still an artist, yeah, but, but are you an author? Well, that's, that's the big question. But then again, a photographer also finds these things. So I don't know what, what it's, it differentiates it's, me from. A, so the photographer frames it. So yeah. I could also say I find them and then I frame them because I first go to the place in the latent space mm. where, where they live. Mm. And by taking them out of the space, I frame them. So I would say, to me, it's kind of like a photography analogy, and I. That, that I understand, I'm but we have. Uh, well, there's there's case law from the the Court of Justice now as well that indeed you can make a number uh, of. Excuse me, uh, you have to. Now you'll never know. Oh. I think we'll end on that point that um, there is a conceptual change. We will stress these questions in uh, more panels to come. But thank you for the good questions. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>